uh, you, you've got some anecdotes about, which is when, when the heroine tries to commit suicide in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something before we see the, the clip or after? Well, I'll say this. So Rules of Attraction was the first movie that I was totally in control of from beginning to end. And um, Roger Avery had written the script, uh, but didn't own the rights to the book, and, which is not the smartest thing to do. And he called me and said, I have the script. Do you want to read it? I just wrote it because I love this book. Um, can you see if you can get the rights? And so I called up uh, Randy Sinellis. I called him directly, actually. And the rights had just lapsed. And so um, I bought the rights, and we made the movie with Lionsgate. Um, the reason I asked to show that, that clip was there's a few reasons. First, when we shot it, Roger Avery, the director, just had it in his head that he needed that song by Harry Nilsson, Without You. And so he played it while we were shooting the scene. And, um, and then he edited that scene that night. And he was so taken with it, he said, I need this. I can't finish this movie unless you get me the song. <laughs> and uh, so I had to go track down the song. And Badfinger uh, wrote it. Harry Nilsson recorded it, but Badfinger actually wrote it. Um, and what I didn't know at the time was three of the four members of Badfinger committed suicide. And it was, and in order to get the rights to the song, I had to track down all four members of all four families and get them to sign off. One of them was in Saudi Arabia, one was in Germany, one was in England, uh, and the fourth we never found, but they let us do it without, I think everyone was deceased from, from that part of the family, but, uh, so it was, it was, it took me nine months, um, but I finally found everyone and got them to, and wrote everyone individual letters, and um, tried to explain the context of the scene and how important it was to the movie, and ultimately, God, I was very proud of that. But what's more interesting about that scene, in the actual version, you see her take the razor blade and cut. And when it came time to get a rating um, in the states, you have to go in front of the uh, in front of the ratings board, and they wouldn't give it an R rating because they said there were too many seconds of the razor blade cut, and so. Roger was incensed, and he refused to cut any of it. So we went in front of them, and, and Roger and I gave speeches as to why the scene was so important, why we needed every second of that. I think it was like six seconds of a cut. And um, they refused, and they made us cut it. And Roger was really upset. And his answer to that was, um, he just went back and he put it back in. And he realized they... they they screen the movies. Please don't tell anyone I told you guys this story. <laughs> they screen the movies for the ratings board, but they never actually screen them again before the prints go out to the movie theaters. And so the, the version that came out in the theaters was actually the full length of the cut that they had denied us. Um, that's the United States ratings board for you. But I guess the British ones even more difficult. Now you, you were executive producer on this. I think everyone... You know, not on, on that one? Really? I was a producer on that one. Okay, but this might be a good point at which you could enlighten us. What's the difference between associate producer, I have no idea. producer, line producer? I don't know. <laughs> because you often see these different players. I think line producer is the person who actually goes out and... Line producer is actually the only one who actually knows what he's doing and actually does the real job. Line producer is the nuts and bolts producer. He's the person who deals with the unions and makes, um, uh, makes individual deals. The producer... There's really very little distinction between an executive producer and a producer. It's co-producer. Well, a co-producer, I think, is generally usually someone who's a little bit junior or an associate producer. I think if there was a hierarchy, it would be associate producer, co-producer, executive producer, and then a producer. Um, the Producers Guild in the United States is trying to regulate credits. And so when you have to get nominated for an Academy Award, there's an arbitration process, and so you have to, in order to be nominated for a category, you have to have a producing credit, not an executive producing credit. Um, but to stop the proliferation of producing credits, because it was getting ridiculous, like there were 12 producers who were winning Academy Awards, so they decided to come up with uh, a self-censored arbitration process where you have to submit a questionnaire and show um, what you've done for the movie. And I think they break it down into 25% uh, development, mm -hmm. 25% pre-production, 25% uh, production, and 25% post-production sales and marketing. That's and how often, they... If a project's put into turnaround, very often producers who've been involved with the first 
attempt to make that film go Stay on their names are on the credits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have anything to do with the film. Yeah, I have credits on, on some of the movies. I've never met these people. I don't even know who they are. Yeah. It happens sometimes. <laughs> Saul Zanz, well, uh, the producer of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and English Patient, once said that uh, he would never green light a project until he had a great script, even if that took years. Now, do you agree with that as producer? Do you wait until you have a script that's right? Yeah, I think ideally that would be wonderful, but it doesn't usually work like that. Movies are sometimes made on their own timeline. And so, in a perfect world, like The Hurt Locker uh, was a finished script. It was Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bull had worked on it together. By the time I got it, the version that I read, and I think I was the first person to read it, um, was essentially the, the, the version that we shot. Um, and there was very little editing that went on. The latest one that we just did, Zero Dark Thirty, was written in two months. And the version that, <laughs> the first version that I read was pretty much the version that we, that we made. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Mar written right after the assassination of Osama bin Laden? Yeah. yeah. What happened is, there's a movie coming out that, that I produced called Zero Dark Thirty, Captain Bigelow's new film. And what happened was, we were making another film it was called Kill Bin Laden, and it was about um, a mission in 2001 when Delta Force tracked him into the Tora Bora Mountains, and they were asked to find him. This is before um, the United States officially had a military position in Afghanistan. If you remember, after 9-11, uh, they sent the CIA and they sent special forces in. And so they sent Delta to go essentially undercover. It was really an incredible operation because they weren't actually allowed to be there. So they had to go ally themselves with the Northern Alliance and trek across the Torbor Mountains and find Bin Laden. And uh, they found him, and they had a line of sight on him. They had several, they had radio trackers. They knew exactly where he was. But when it came time to call in coordinates and drop the bomb, the order was denied. Um, and the head of Delta Force wrote a book about it. Um, and he said, I don't want fame. I don't want money. I just want people to know that my men actually succeeded, they did what they were told to do, and it was a, it's a fantastic story. Mm -hmm. And so we were making that, and we were in pre-production, and I got a phone call on May 1st, 2001, saying, turn on the TV, and they had killed Osama bin Laden. And I called Catherine, and I said, what do you think? And she said, we're scrapping the other movie. And we were yeah. really months away from shooting. Yeah. And it was her decision, she made it that night, she said, we're scrapping the other movie, we're gonna do this movie. This is what's relevant now. And so Mark Bull, whose first job as an investigative journalist went to Washington and just started tracking leads. And he ended up getting the story that you'll see if you see the movie when it comes out in December, which is, um, which is mostly the intelligence hunt, the seven-year hunt to find him, and then ultimately the raid in Abbottabad in 2001, or 2011. How was Robert Redford as a, as a big star actor Going behind the camera, obviously, he had been and directing with yeah. But does that, for a producer, does that make it more difficult to have a, a star personality like that who would want to perhaps control the actors? Well, I, I don't know, the choice of actors more than... You know, surprisingly, Redford is very hands-off with the actors. I think as an actor himself, he doesn't like to... He, I don't think he really like to be directed. Mm. And so I don't think he really likes to direct actors. He has a certain way. He'll talk to them. Yeah. He'll talk to them about the part, but... Um, there's not a lot of whispering in an actor's ear. There's not a lot of direction and go one way or the other. It is there is a challenge with Robert Redford because he's such a legend. Um, an actor on the movie actually said it best. It's sometimes it's hard to negotiate around the mythology and actually just talk to the person directly because you're so in awe of him. Um, and as a producer, I worked with him for for something like two years on this movie. And so at some point, it's like, oh, it's Bob, but like. People, when they meet him, are uh, there's a certain reverence there, and it, it, sometimes it can make it difficult. So an actor who would come in for a day, it's happened a lot with a lot of the day players, where they were really nervous mm. to be around him. Uh, but he's he does he has this way of making people feel comfortable. Mm. He could just equalize, um, and so once they actually got to know him and talk to him, it was okay. Yeah, yeah, but he's he's he was brilliant to work with. Did he have final cut on that picture? Or yeah, I'm trying to think of a director who hasn't had Final Cut. Well, no, no, I think it was... Uh, he definitely had Final yeah, Cut. But, but they all say they do, but I mean, I'm sure there are, uh, say, producer Max Hall's ends, I'm sure yeah. uh, at a certain point can make very forceful arguments. I think so when you're making an independent film with a very strong director, generally they, they, they have Final Cut, and they exercise it 
but the good ones will listen. Redford actually surprisingly um, had me into the editing room, I think in like the second week of, of editing. It was right away. It was, I, I want to hear feedback and he would constantly ask people their opinion and as he pared it down, pared it down. Mm -hmm. It's usually about length. Mm -hmm. That's usually the fight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but, and Catherine Bigelow has it as well. And we had a fight on Hurt Locker. Mm -hmm. I think Hurt Locker was two hours and uh, six minutes, mm -hmm. and the studio wanted it to come in uh, under two hours, mm -hmm. and she refused to cut the six minutes. Uh, I think to the benefit of the film. But when it gets to things like promotion and the way the film is sold to the public, then I guess is where <coughs> your role expands again after the shooting. That you're you're very much involved as producer in, in the way that is presented by the distributor. Yeah, the, for sure. I, there is a bit of, I, I'm day to day in developing the movie, I'm day to day on production on set. Um, once it goes into the editing room, it's generally the director and the editor. Um, and so you get to take a little vacation as a producer for you know, uh, six to ten, eight, ten weeks. But you'd be working on something else at the yeah, same time. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then you know, there's a whole post-production process and then ultimately, um, yeah, you're dealing with the studio um, and selling it. That's a critical part of what the producer does. Now, the Hurt Locker, uh, just before we talk about it, can you tell us what that title means? No. Because no, at no point in the film, I've seen it several times, at no point in the film does it describe it. I just thought you'd be able to enlighten it. It's a, it's a military term. It's actually a sports terminology, I think is where it came from, but it was appropriated by um, people in the military. I think it means a place of total pain and punishment. And so they would use it as, like, if you're going to go downrange uh, to go detonate that bomb, you're going to be in the hurt locker. Mm -hmm. It's like the worst possible place you could be. And when did you become attached to it? Well, by the way, that? there was, everybody tried to change that title. The, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, it sounded, to, you know, I think someone said it sounded like a, like a, an s and movie. Yeah. Or like a porn <laughs> movie, like the hurt locker. Uh, and there were several attempts to change it, but Catherine wouldn't, she refused. Mm -hmm. She loved it. And ultimately, it, it it takes on its own. And the business was good for the picture in proportion to its budget, actually. At the end of the day, the, although the box office wasn't in the hundreds of millions, yeah. it was in proportion to the budget. In proportion to the budget. But that was an interesting experience because we made the movie and we thought that uh, when it came out, it got really exceptional reviews. And we thought that and audiences really loved it. And so we thought that there was a chance that it was really going to penetrate the box office. But at the time, I don't think that people were interested. I don't know if they're interested now in seeing movies about war, which is unfortunate, because I like making movies about war. But um, I think there's a fatigue in the United States. Well, there was a, a big time lapse. I saw it in Venice in 2008. Yes. And then it didn't come out in the States until June of the following year. Yes. Why was that? Well, we, we took it to Venice, and then we took it to Toronto, and sold it to Summit at Toronto. and. They said, we love this movie, we want to release it, we're going to give it a really big release in the fall. And then we got back to the United States and we had our first meeting with them and they said, we have this little movie that we made that's going to come out, it's called Twilight. And, they wanted, <laughs> and once I heard that, I was like, forget it. They're, they're not releasing the movie this year. So they held it. They held it for, to make room for Twilight. Um, and then ultimately it was going to be a 2009 release. And we had a big battle with them, actually. Uh, Catherine and I and Mark wanted the movie to come out in September because we felt that it would get more attention after the summer. And the studio was intent on putting it out in, uh, in the middle of the summer. We thought the counter-programming just is a theory that's never been borne out to be true. Um, but and it, it certainly wasn't in our case. Every once in a while there's a sleeper hit over the summer. That, but ours came out against Transformers. Transformers made a lot of money. Ours made not very much. And it had to endure six months of word of mouth for the Oscars because very often the, the Oscar winner comes from films released from the fall. Two, three, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it was an interesting experience because it was forgotten. It left theaters after a couple months. It played for a little bit. It never really got uh, a tremendous amount of traction. And then I went to go make The Conspirator, actually. And I was in Savannah in the fall making the movie and wasn't really thinking much about The Hurt Locker. And all of a sudden I got a phone call saying that we won a Film Critics Award. I thought, wow, really? We won an award. That's so exciting. And then there was another one. And then uh, the first award show, the one was the Gotham Awards, the Independent Film Awards in, in New York. Um, and then it just started taking on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. But that was a good six months after the release of the film. And 
You know, when the movie came out, nobody was talking about the Catherine Woods. How did you get attached to it? How did you meet Catherine Beasley? I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's a manager who knows Catherine, just uh, is friendly with her. He had an actor uh, that he represented that was in K-19. And um, he called me and said, do you like Catherine Bigelow? Do you like her work? I said, yeah, of course. I love Strange Days and Point Break. He said, she has a script. She doesn't know quite what to do with it or how to get it financed. Um, would you like to read it? So he sent it to me. I read it. I loved it. I went and met with her. And um, we talked for a couple hours. The truth is, I walked out of the room thinking that movie's never going to get made. But I really like Catherine, and it'll be an interesting relationship to build, and maybe we'll go make another movie. Um, but she was dogged. There was no, there was no way she wasn't going to make a movie. She was so committed to it. So the next step after you'd had that conversation, you go out of the room. You have to raise the money. You have to go and make all your liaisons. And yes. Yeah. How did um, you do that? Well, it, we sent it to um, a financier, a foreign sales agent, named Nicholas Chartier, um, and he loved it and he was committed to it. And he said, "I will make this movie. Um, I'll give you." Um, I think at the time it was. $12 million, dollars, or $11 or $12 million. Dollars. And Catherine had a, um, a number in her head. We had a budget prepared, it was $18 million, dollars, and she said, I cannot make this for a penny less than that. And um, so we didn't go with Nick, and we tried, I, I ran around the world for like six months trying to raise the money through various sources, and ultimately that was the most that we could get was, was from Nick, so we went back to him, and, uh, and he financed it. But the Hurt Locker is living proof that you can make a film uh, by an American director with American actors without pre-sales to the United States. There was no sale, there was a gap, yeah. That's yeah. often being said, you can't do that, but obviously that worked and... No, a lot of movies are done. I mean, the James Gray film that I just made was made without a domestic distributor. If you have equity, if someone puts that money yeah. against domestic, then yeah. that's the way to do it. Yeah. The Conspirator was made without a domestic distributor. We took it to Toronto and sold it there. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the first uh, clip we're going to show is of James defusing a bomb, and this introduced Jeremy Renner, at least to most of us. I think Jeremy yeah. Renner was a big discovery of that film. He's now, of course, Jason Bourne, uh, and he was great in Mission Impossible 4. You know, he's got a real charisma, and were you involved in, in, in choosing him? Yeah, I'll tell you an interesting story about Jeremy Renner. So, I was going to the Sarajevo Film Festival. Um, and I was going with a friend of mine who's Jeremy Renner's agent, and hasn't been his agent for a while. And we were sitting next to each other on the plane. I had just met with Catherine. And so I had the script, and I was just reading it to make notes on it. Um, and he, he said, what are you reading? And I said, it's a script. I'm thinking about doing it. I don't know if it's ever getting made. It's called The Hurt Locker. Catherine Bigelow's going to direct. And he said, can I read it? And so he read it on the plane. And he said, do you know who would be perfect for this is Jeremy Renner? And I said, not a chance. There's no way we're going to finance this movie with Jeremy Renner. No one's ever heard of him. He's a great actor, but there's no way. That's not how movies get financed. And he said, will you just do me a favor? He's in London shooting 28 weeks later. Will you fly to London at the end of the festival and go sit down with him? And I said, I don't really need to. I know Jeremy. I know him personally. I know his work. And I don't need to go. And he said, I'm asking you as a favor. Fly to London. And so I flew to London, and I sat down with Jeremy. And in the course of an hour, he so impressed me with his understanding of the character and what he wanted to do with it. I called Catherine. I left the hotel where we were meeting. I called Catherine. I said, this is going to sound crazy, but you need to meet Jeremy Renner. And she actually had seen Dahmer, the movie that he had done. And so she was aware of him. And so she said, OK. So Jeremy flew on a break back to Los Angeles uh, with Catherine. And, and she cast him in that moment. That's it's always an advantage that there are no stars in that picture. It was definitely the intent. It was her idea was to not use mm. actors, not use movie stars. Mm. Um, is that why the sort of Ray Fiennes comes in almost as a, as a, as a little favor, you feel? Well, it was, it was one of the conditions that Nicolas Chartier said. He said, I can make this movie with no movie stars, but you need to cast at least a couple people that we can sell the movie on yeah. internationally. And Rafe was one of them. Guy Pierce was one of them. Uh, so he probably did that part in one or two days shooting, I guess. Rafe was about a week. Really? Yes. Yeah, that was a very long sequence in the movie. Yeah, that took about a week to shoot. We talked about torture and drama as possibly being difficult to sell, war films being difficult to sell. Mm -hmm. But when you have a picture like that, and you know it may have that built in disadvantage, how important today are the post first weekend results? I mean, 
home video must be an enormous factor over the years, the, the television sales and so on, mm -hmm. whereas 30, 40 years ago that wasn't so. Right. Uh, how, well, uh, home video is actually really suffering right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are download movies. Hurt Locker was the most uh, pirated, the second most pirated film of the year. Avatar was the, what I think was the first. Mm -hmm. But there were more, there were 10 million illegal downloads for that movie. A lot of people that I know watched it by illegally downloading it. They confessed to me later. Uh, so those, those, those alternate revenue streams are, are suffering. I think everyone's feeling it. Because it used, it used to be you can count on a huge chunk of the ancillary profits from a movie coming from home video, and that's just not the case anymore. Well, why isn't the technology there to stop that parity? I don't, that's a question for someone who's much more mm -hmm. intelligent than me. I have no idea. That the studios have not been able to come up with something yeah. that can encrypt yeah. films sufficiently. Yeah, right? but it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's, they, they can't do it. I think they're, they're just generally behind. It's the same thing we saw in music, mm -hmm. and they couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's becoming more and more with iTunes and people downloading legally, and uh, file sharing isn't quite uh, the problem that it, that it was a couple years ago. When you see a screenplay for a film like The Hurt Locker, do you get any sense of what the ultimate film will look like? I mean, that very intense visceral camera work uh, really marks out The Hurt Locker, but I guess yeah. it wasn't in the script. It's, it is and it isn't. I mean, there's a sense of it. There's certainly a sense of place. Um, one of the things that Catherine and I discussed early was that she wanted to shoot it on 16mm, and we, we looked at a couple of references. Uh, of things that were shot in 16, and that was the aesthetic that she wanted to maintain. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we found Barry Ackroyd, who had done, who had worked with Paul Greengrass, and he had that very immediate handheld uh, uh, aesthetic that he used. And so he was he was hired specifically for that. Nice. Yeah. Um, the second extract we have from Hurt Locker is, is shows the human side of, of the Tremere and the character of when he has been rather taken by a boy who he buys a DVD from yeah. and calls him Beckham. Beckham yeah. And then he goes in search for him and so doing goes, I guess, out of yeah. the green zone and uh, gets into uh, difficulties. So, but this shows wonderful night shooting. Uh, I'll tell you just a quick anecdote about the scene that we just saw. That sequence was the first sequence that we shot in the movie. And it, the very first day of it, uh, I think it was 47 degrees outside. And Jeremy has to wear that bomb suit, and those bomb suits are built with an air conditioning system to cool down the tech who's inside of it. Um, but the air conditioning system has a whirring sound, and you can't hear the dialogue, and so we had to disable it. So Jeremy is in that without, and in 47 degrees, and the, we had to keep his body temperature down. So what we would do is he could only shoot for a few minutes. So every take was a few minutes, and as soon as the take was done, we would sit him down, take the helmet on, and, and put uh, cold compresses on his head to keep his body temperature down. And there was a, a Palestinian girl that was hired to do that. And <laughs> I swear to God, this is a true story. Halfway through the first day, she's putting the cold compress on his head, and I'm watching her do it, and, and blood starts to come out of her nose, and she's, she's having heat stroke, and she passes out. And Jeremy is sitting there like this, sweating profusely. He turns around, he looks, and he's like, how the fuck am I going to make it through this day? <laughs> <laughs> and that poor girl was, yeah, she was taken to the hospital. But Jeremy, every single day, in that bomb suit, in that heat, it was really, physically, it was one of the most arduous things I've ever seen an actor do. Was that shot in Jordan? It was shot in Jordan, yeah. Uh, and that, that scene actually was at, uh, I forget the name, it's a Palestinian refugee camp, is where we shot it. Um, is that one of the logistical problems you have to solve as a producer to get visas and permissions to shoot in, in foreign countries? Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the Jordan in and of itself was an interesting story because we were originally going to shoot in Morocco, in, in a set of Casablanca, which is where a lot of people shoot movies um, that are set in the Middle East. And so we scouted Casablanca, and Catherine said, I want to go to Oman. She, Mark Bull had had uh, someone that he knew through the military. Uh, lived in Amman, and so they went and scouted Amman, and she realized in Amman she could shoot 360 degrees, and the production design of that was invaluable, mm -hmm. because it looks yeah. so much like Baghdad. Yeah. Um, but there's no film infrastructure in Jordan. That's the difficulty of shooting in a place like that. In Casablanca, I mean, in, um, in Morocco, they make a lot of movies, and so there's a lot of camera equipment, there's a lot yeah. of crew, and people understand. In Jordan, it was, uh, you know, it's, 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 they're trying to build a homegrown industry.
and extras, easy to get extras in a country like that? That was another problem, actually. We, Catherine really wanted to cast Iraqis as extras, and there's a, there was, at the time, I think there was like 750,000 expats who had escaped the war. Um, and so we had, we had our own little mini battles. There was, there was a number of Iraqi Christians that were there, and then there were a lot of um, Jordanian Muslims, and they didn't always get along. It was like a little uh, mini version of a war on the set. But they were great, actually. They were all well paid. And the, uh, the music is very important at the, at the end of that sequence. And I was going to ask you about music at what point. Mm -hmm. Music comes in, and is the producer involved in, in choosing? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, in that movie, again, this was something that was uh, organized from the very beginning. Catherine didn't want a lot of music; she wanted most of it to be sound design. And so there's a, a sound designer that I had worked with, ironically, who had <laughs> done one of the Harold and Kumar movies, who was also a brilliant sound designer named Paul Audison, um, who worked with Sam Raimi and done Spider Man also. And I introduced him to Catherine. And he loved it. He ultimately did the movie for free, essentially. Um, it was on it for months. And so most of, there's very little music in the movie. Um, it was Marco Botrami and Buck Sanders did the score, which is really beautiful. I, I quite loved it, but, um, but she used very little of it. Almost subliminal. Yeah. 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 Well, can we have some questions? And please, uh, based on my experience yesterday, can we have questions rather than statements? <laughs> and, and the shorter the better. Do we have mic we have mics, so please wait until the mic reaches you. So, okay, this gentleman there. Um, hello, uh, my name is Wood, uh, director from Austria and I have a question about your work with the studios because you know you, you said it a few times um, but I, I didn't understand how it is really uh, where is the responsibility of uh, from you and the responsibility of the studio? And how you work together because uh, you um, the set uh, for example the uh, in Hard Locker it was a few minutes uh, too long the studio wanted to cut it off right. under two hours and you said um, uh, Catherine uh, didn't want it right. so um, but you know you are the producer and uh, where are your responsibilities and the of the studio. It's a tough balance because you want to please both sides. I mean, ultimately, the way that I see my role as a producer is to be in service of the director. So in that particular case, it was an easy decision. She wanted to keep the movie where she, she had it, and, um, and I supported her. And we, we talked to the studio. And the studio was actually great. They asked for it to be cut. They came up with a couple suggestions. She didn't want to do it. And um, so we kept it the way it is. But you're always fighting between trying to please the studio and support the director. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a battle from beginning to end. Another question? One there and then one there. Hi there. Um, did you ever stumble upon a, uh, a real life story that you wanted to make a film out of? Or also maybe if you wanted to, to make a film out of a book and in those situations, what was usually your best sales argument that they should pick you to make a film out of their story? Oh, like a book, for example? Well, personally, I'm in a situation that I want to uh, I stumble upon a real life story right. and I want to make right. a, a film out of it. And I'm having problems getting these, uh, getting, getting the rights. Right. So, how do you convince people? Well, it depends. It's a different situation every time. Um, I think what I like to do is sit down, I'll fly to wherever they are, I'll, I'll usually send an email um, or write a letter, ask for an audience, sit down with them, and I think the first step is just trying to get to know them and have them develop a certain amount of comfort and rapport because it's their life and they're going to want it portrayed in a fair and honest way. And so the, the best way to do that is not to go and say, um, here's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to sell it to this studio, I'm going to attach this actor and this director, and we're going to make it, it's a $100 million film, it's going to be great. The best thing I find to do is just to gain trust um, and, and get to know them personally one-on-one, -on -one. and then, um, then you can lay out a plan for how you want to realize uh, what it is. But it's the same whether it's a book, like the, the story that I told you before about Rules of Attraction, 
that, that screenplay existed, uh, but we didn't have the rights to the book. And we couldn't tell Brad Easton Ellis that there was a screenplay already written for it, because that would have really hurt our leverage in the negotiation. So it was just sitting down with them and saying, we love your work, um, and we'll do honor to it. Um, and ultimately, he saw uh, Roger's first film, Killing Zoe, and, uh, and liked it. And so he let us acquire the rights. But um, yeah, I, I couldn't stress enough how important it is to, to try to develop trust and, and, and show that, that you'll do honor <laughs> to their story. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I have one right now, by the way. I'm doing developing a, another film with Jeremy Renner about Steve McQueen. Oh. And um, Steve's uh, first wife, Neil McQueen Adams, um, is still alive. And so that was, we wanted to get her rights because she's a critical part of, of that story. And so that was sitting down on many occasions, just sitting, having coffee, having tea, getting to know her. And then ultimately, uh, ultimately she gave us the rights. And someone from right here, in the middle. Um, my name is Hussein. I'm Kurdish director from uh, Germany, Austria. Uh, I have a question um, for uh, American producer. How you see uh, European directors? You know, when when they want to make, um, oh, how the uh, American producers and studios right. look at European directors because we have a little different system mm -hmm. here of working in European uh, films. And um, well, we had once a Peter Morgan at, at our film academy, and well, he said once from the author view that um, producers in the USA they like uh, to make movies with them, but they don't like when they stay in Hollywood. You know, they <laughs> that's what he said. They, they want like making their first film, but they don't like making a second. Well, and they don't like them to stay there. Like there, he had one example of a German um, director. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I, I just want your uh, opinion or what, what you think about European directors and you think about working with them and how, how the producers in, in the U.S. see? I, I think to be honest, talent is talent, uh, wherever it comes from. I, I wouldn't say that I'm more interested in working with the European directors uh, versus American directors. Um, I do think there is an interest. There's something about, sometimes when you're telling very American stories, it's really nice to have Uh, a European or someone internationally with a different perspective um, come and tell that story. I think that that's, it's, it's an interesting way in because um, they have a different life experience, they have a different perspective. But certainly, uh, I don't know why he would say they don't like them to stay. We love them to stay. Well, Maybe people get a little corrupted the, by... Lubitsch. I mean, they're, they're great. Hollywood was, Hollywood was built by... Uh, Directors, certainly German. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, his example was well, it can't stay under us. It was Florian von Dannersmark. He said he, right. he came there and That stayed <laughs> after he won the Oscar. I think what he's saying is is that there's uh, you know the first one that I worked on with Ignolti was uh, a movie called Mulholland Falls, and Lee Tomahori directed it. And Lee had made an amazing film, a small New Zealand film called Once for Warriors, and it was so personal, it was so powerful, and. When he came to Hollywood, he was surrounded by big talents, not just actors, but like department heads. Um, I remember that film, The Xanax produced it, Dick Xanax, who just recently passed away. And the decision was made, Lee was very young and inexperienced as a director, and so he surrounded him with some of the best people in the business. Um, Dick Silver was the production designer, and Haskell Wexler was the DP, and It just kind of went on, and it was a difficult experience actually because they they thought that they knew more than the director. They had more experience, and so they there was a lot of pushback, um, and it was difficult for Lee. Ultimately, you know, he made a fine film, I think. Um, but after that, he started making films that I would say were less personal, more Hollywood studio films, um, and it's a shame. And he's just recently I saw him recently. He just did this film, The Devil's Double, about um, Saddam Hussein's son, uh, with Dominic Cooper, and he's now getting back into where he started, so it's come full circle. So maybe that's what Peter was talking about. When they stay, they end up doing studio films, which are less interesting, less personal. 
Last question: uh, What do you think about European directors like or European films like from uh, Michael Haneke or I don't know the, the typical artos European? I mean, they're brilliant. I think Michael Haneke is one of the best directors alive today, um, and I hope he never makes an American film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. You should just continue to make. I don't know why. I, I know there's a desire to work on a bigger canvas, um, but if you're making really personal films. Um, I think that translates. You know, Michael Haneke has no problem with people seeing his movies. Um, if he went and worked within the studio system, it would probably be very difficult. To be honest, the directors that I work with, the American directors, don't work well within the studio system. Kevin Bigelow, the last two films have been outside the studio system. Robert Redford, the last two films outside the studio system. Um, James Gray has never made a film inside the studio system. Um, you know, so it, it's not so much nationality, it's just more how you approach the filmmaking. It's what I do, it's mostly independent film um, because it allows the, the director to realize their vision. Mm. Other questions? Hi, Greg. Uh, my name is Andreas from Screen International. Mm -hmm. um, I have three quick questions. Um, to what extent do you think it's essential? for a producer in LA making the kind of films you want to make um, to understand the intricacies of film finance. Mm -hmm. um, second question is, what are you going to be filming next? What's the film that's next going into production? Mm -hmm. And third, it's a kind of a strange one, but it's just on my mind. Do you think, uh, to any extent, um, Scientology is some kind of a refuge for actors after the studio system is not quite as nurturing as it used to be? Do you think in some ways that could, could be drawn out of that. Maybe, maybe not. Somehow when the studio system broke down in Hollywood in the 40s and 50s, that's when Scientology came. I, I'm, just, I'm just, just putting it out there. I'm just putting it out ever, there. If anyone's ever... Uh, that's the theme of the monster. Yeah. Um, the first part of your question is, do I think that it's essential for film? Yes, to understand finance. And yeah. You don't need to, ultimately. I think it's possible to make a movie if you have a great script and you can find a great director and attach great actors, you can turn it over to someone else who can do that for you. But I find that it's very helpful to understand every aspect of it. Um, so that's essential. The second part of your question, I don't know, is my honest answer. I, I don't know. There's several that are going to come up, but I haven't picked which one yet. Um, and the third one, I, I, I don't even know how to comment on that. <laughs> Scientology, I don't know, but let me think about that. I have many friends who are Scientologists, and they're very, um, they're very private about their, their personal beliefs, um, and they all say that it's helped them. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a religion, religion's a refuge for people for all kinds of reasons. I don't see why Scientology should be any different. Has it helped their bank balance? <laughs> I, that's another question, I think. You know, yeah, there, there's certainly a network within Hollywood yeah, of people sure. who are Scientologists, yeah. and um, you know, they, they help each other out. I mean, and sure. yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's so many young actors that you don't realize are Scientologists. It's not like that pervasive, mm. I don't think, but um, really fair enough. Another question? I heard that the Bin Laden film was supposed to come out uh, before Wrong. the election. Wrong. Not true. <laughs> Is that not true? Never true. So that's yeah. just... What happened was, it, 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 yeah, it's unfortunate. Technically, it was impossible for the movie to come out before the election because uh, of when we were shooting it. And, and in fact, we, we finished shooting it in May. And if it'll be ready in December, it'll be a, an achievement you know, to actually get it done. But there was an article that was written in the New York Times that said that the movie was going to come out in October and, uh, and insinuated the movie was somehow politically motivated and was going to somehow, I don't know what they thought actually, there was going to be a scene of Obama on a table, you know, <laughs> banging the table saying we've got to find him and kill him. There's nothing like that in the movie. The movie is totally political actually. But because that article was written, there was a congressman. Um, <laughs> who decided to uh, issue a formal inquiry, um, and that's ongoing. But uh, formal, a formal inquiry. it was a congressional inquiry as to whether or not Mark Bull had inappropriate access 
to the CIA and to the Department of Defense and to the White House, and it was found that there was none. He's just a good journalist. And what about the book that's recently been written by the man who took part in that, mm -hmm. which really blew the lid off certain aspects of the operation? Yeah. Was Catherine able to incorporate them into that, or was she interested? You'll see, actually, I mean, when you, if you see the movie, you'll see it's actually remarkably similar, his account, um, as to what happened in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I will put that to Mark Wolf, who did his job and did it very well, but not exactly um, how that raid operated. Yes, I've got one lady in the front and then a gentleman. Ladies first. Okay, then this. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, my question is that as a producer, mm -hmm. when you read scripts, mm -hmm. um, is it a certain kind of genre that you would like to stick to when, you, when you're making films? Or is it something maybe if you come across a script, and you think, okay, I have, it's maybe some things about the script is not very commercial, or to be able to make that, to, to get the money to make those films, right. do you, do you, would you like, do you normally, would you work on that script if you really, really like the idea, or is it, that, okay, it's a great script, but... Right, but it's not commercial. Yeah. And then there's no way we're going to finance it. Yeah. No way it's going to get made. Yeah. yeah, of course, I do it every time. <laughs> That's almost always the case. I mean, Herlock was a great example of, it was a brilliant script, I really liked the director, and I thought to myself, there's no way this movie's going to get financed, but I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you, once you get involved in it, once you start working on it, they become like, it becomes like a child that you have to see uh, matriculated through school and, and sent off into the world, and so you just fight and you never stop. Um, but there's no genre that I, I, I kind of go all over the place. I mean. I think people sometimes question, how do you go from Harold and Kumar to The Hurt Locker? Yeah. And I, I don't know. My answer to that is, is they're the same movie to me. And I know that sounds strange, <laughs> but I love them both. And I love them for different reasons. But it is nice sometimes when you do a very serious movie to go and make a comedy or do something different. You know? Which is really interesting because that, you know, I'm seeing in the selection of films that you do tend to move from one thing yeah. to another, which is really fantastic because a lot of producers you see they only make do one stick thing, to yeah. Yeah. a certain genre mm. on and and so that that's really great um the other uh, question which i had was as a producer when you first started were there moments when you felt within your within your producing like you know life that you felt gosh you know i've had enough of it I'm i still feel that <laughs> and what more like I, I, I'm never going to, I'm never going to make a living out of this. I'm never going to survive. I'm never going to, yeah. I don't know. I, there's a little bit of, of that disease. I think I, I learned it from Nick Nolte when I was very young, where it's like there's, you love what you're doing so much, but every time you finish a movie, you think, I'm never going to get another movie made. <laughs> you know? And I have that every time. There's always like a, it's a weird, you know, making movies are, are like, um, putting a family together and so when you're on set you're with these people every day and every time a movie ends it's like getting divorced and so you go through this postpartum depression afterwards i do on every single movie where i think you know i don't know what i'm going to do i have to rebuild my career after this one um but then there's always another movie there's always something else to do um but yeah i do like going it's funny that that scene, the first clip that we saw, the other reason I wanted to show it from Rules of Attraction, in the actual version with the slitting of the wrist, it's very intense. And we took the movie to the London Film Festival and showed it in front of the UK distributor. And um, someone in the audience had an epileptic seizure during that scene. And they, walk, they were having it, and this man was having a seizure. He was walking up the aisle, and he passed out in my arms. I was in the back of the theater. Passed out. And, and I, we put him in the seat, the paramedics came and took him away, and I, I swore, I said, my next movie, I cannot have anything that's even remotely serious. I just need it to be a comedy, I need it to be fun, people need to laugh, I can't do this anymore. Um, and that's when I found Harold and Kumar. I came back and, um, and I found that script, and I thought, and that's another movie that made no sense. I got that script from uh, an agent who represented the writers, and he was sending it out not to make, he was as a writing sample for trying to get them work as comedy writers. 
And I said, I love this. I want to make this movie. And he was like, no one's going to make a movie about a Korean and an Indian. It's just a comedy. It will never happen. But I said, I need to make a comedy, and this is the one. And so we tried. I just, we happened to find a financier who wanted to take a chance on it. Mm -hmm. It became a franchise. And it became a franchise, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question from this gentleman here? She asked my question, actually. Oh, okay. It's exactly mine. Okay. So. Another question. At the back, and then this gentleman. Hello. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the situation of production for the Hurt Locker. You said there was a studio behind and... The studio bought it. It was an independent, oh, okay. it was an independent film. There was no studio while we were making the movie, but when we uh, sold it to Summit at Toronto. Once it was finished... Once then it was, was finished, yeah. It was totally done. Because my but question was this one, actually. It was about the ending, because I thought this was such a powerful film. Yeah. You know, a film with guts. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> also, as an American film, yeah. about a topic on American fellow citizens, even they are soldiers. And but I was uh, I had question about the ending because after the the man blows up, mm. is it an ending that is is there to please someone or who wrote the ending or you know because there's a kind of. Well, he doesn't blow up at the end. At the very end of the movie, he he goes home to his family and then he decides to reenlist and he goes back to. He goes back to Iraq. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is a suicide bomber that happens right before that. Is that yes, what you're the suicide. I am. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yes. What was the question though? Uh, no, I was no, I was just wondering if there was um, any pressure about the ending from mm. someone, or, no. or it's total freedom to no, write no, no, the no. ending of the film. Yeah, no. Mark and Catherine really just did. They they came up with the structure of that movie, and Mark wrote the script, and it's exactly what what was in that first draft is really what's in the movie. Um, okay. And they're the same. Just to clarify though, so you understand, we sold the movie to Summit, to the studio, and uh, before they released it, they said, and they were incredibly supportive, but they said, we love this, we just think that it would play better if it was a couple of minutes shorter. Um, but ultimately she, she decided she didn't want to. Actually, I'm interested, as an aside, mm. your definition of studio, would you call Lionsgate and Summit Studios? I mean, for us, it's the old-fashioned six, six or eight. Hollywood yeah, I mean, I think that I think that people yeah used to refer them as mini majors. Uh, right. Lionsgate was a studio summit. They they merge now, and they're one studio. Mm -hmm. uh, but any 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 distribution company, I would call a studio. Any anyone who has vertical integration, who develops their own material, produces it, and releases it. Mm -hmm. But studios, some of them buy, like the summit. They they buy, acquire, finish films. And this yes, this gentleman in the second row, do we have a mic? Please. Hi, I'm curious about your team behind, I don't know, how many assistants, readers, do you have any? And uh, uh, just a little bit how that works. It's really me and an assistant, and that's it. And I've just always worked like that, I find it easier. Um, I just, I don't know. It's, I, I actually have people in my office, and there are uh, interns who read scripts, but um, it's mostly, it just comes out of... I, I create it myself. I mean, I, it, it's relationships that I have, so people will send me scripts or I'll come up with an idea, but I don't have a development team. Um, some people do, I just I prefer working by myself. Can you ever see yourself in the role like, say, Jeremy Thomas in Britain, who is rather similar to you in the independent producer, but yes. he has, uh, uh, my son interned uh, last month oh, with yeah. him, and it seems that there are about 20, 30 people on staff in that. Yeah, well, Jeremy has a sales company as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, have you ever thought of, of going to that step and, and perhaps coming a sales Yeah, I mean, there's always been the thought of raising financing so you can mm -hmm. finance your own film. Um, mm -hmm. But for the moment, I really enjoy just being a producer. And so it's, you know, the problem when you raise money is you have to make more movies. And mm -hmm. once you make more movies, you can't spend as much time on each one. Um, and there's, you know, I love the process of making it. I love being on set. I love being there from beginning to end. Well, that seems a good moment at which to end because that you've given us an hour and a half of uh, great time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.